Thank you. It's wonderful to be back with the uh, RCAF. I think that this is the third or fourth year that I've been able to come over and spend time with all this incredible group of people. Uh, the last couple of days have been quite eventful. And <laughs> I, it is when I <laughs> committed to this, I think it was six or seven months ago, and I said, well, that is going to be the day after the primary election. So we'll just have to see what's going to happen and whether I can make it over there or not. And fortunately, the folks at RCAF have been flexible enough to work with me. Um, there are, I do want to give you an update on what is going on with the, with the RFID case. Kenny gave you some information, and I'll give you a bit more about that. And then I want to talk to you about a few things that are priorities for me in, in, as I take this next step, uh, I guess, in my, in my career. Uh, first of all, yes, we did win the RFID case. We have been able to block their ability to force all of you to use RFID ear tags. Uh, they started that quite some time ago. Kenny has been your representative on that in, in those efforts for quite some time. Uh, in 2019, as you know, the USDA APHIS issued a guidance document requiring, requiring all of our livestock producers to remove their cattle or, or bison across state lines to use RFID ear tags, with January 1, 2023 being the deadline by which that, had to, that was going to go forward. We filed the lawsuit in October of 2019 challenging that. They knew that what they had done was illegal, that the USDA did not have the legal authority to mandate RFID ear tags, and they immediately withdrew that guidance document and said, never mind, uh, and stood down. But there was one aspect of the case that we wanted to proceed with, and that was we wanted to get more information about who was involved in putting that, that rule together or that guidance document together in the first place. So our lawsuit included a claim under the Federal Advisory Committee Act, which is a transparency good government statute that requires any kind of a an advisory committee for a federal agency to be disclosed and meet certain requirements. Well, clearly, the, the two organizations uh, that USDA APHIS had put together to push forward with the RFID ear tags did not comply with FACA, and we, pushed, and, and we wanted to, to get a, a decision out of the district court judge finding that. We lost at the district court level. Our judge in Wyoming did not understand FACA. Most judges don't. There are very few attorneys that understand FACA. There's very few attorneys that have ever used that particular statutory provision to try to push back against agency overreach. I've had a couple of cases where I've been successful in pushing back by using FACA. It's not a statute that the agencies like. They like doing things in secret rather than doing things out in the open. So we pursued that. We did take it up to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals, and I don't know if any of you were able to watch. I think Bill might have watched it. Maybe Tracy watched the, uh, the oral argument before the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals, but it wasn't very pretty. Um, the 10th Circuit was pretty skeptical of our arguments. In fact, I talked to some of the other attorneys in the room after I got done with oral argument, and they were pretty stunned at, at how the 10th Circuit treated me. It was one of the strangest arguments I've ever had. I've been a trial attorney for 33 years, and I've never had a panel of judges react the way that they reacted to me. Um, so that was the, they ruled against us and ruled that FACA did not apply and that we had missed a deadline, which is not accurate, but uh, they were trying to find an easy way out. Um, right now, we do know that USDA has at least signaled that they want to go forward with the RFID mandate, but they know they have to do it through an official rulemaking under the Administrative Procedure Act. What's interesting is that when they issued their guidance document in 2019, they set the deadline, as I said a moment ago, as January 1, 2023, and said this, they did that almost four years out for purposes of giving our livestock industry sufficient time to be able to, to meet the, the mandate that you would have to, that we'd have to deal with feasibility issues, we'd have to deal with uh, buying the equipment, we'd have to retrofit our sale barns and things like that for our RFID use. And so they said it will take about four years to be able to get that done. What has been very interesting to Bill and Tracy and Kenny and I as, as we've uh, continued to fight this battle is that January 1, 2023 deadline doesn't ever seem to change despite the fact that they've obviously been delayed substantially, now three years, in being able to put that mandate forward. 
So there's something magical about that January 1, 2023 deadline, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to get their documents and we brought the, fa the FACA claim in the first place. So uh, the last I knew, they, they announced yet again, USDA announced yet again, that they were going forward with a rulemaking on the RFID and they were going to try to have it implemented prior to January 1, 2023, which is now less than six months away. Yet I haven't seen anything. I don't know, uh, I, I don't believe that you have. I know that Bill pays a lot of attention to this, Tracy and Kenny as well. And we have not seen a final rule come out. So there's a delay somewhere, but I think that we all need to be paying attention to that January 1, 2023 date, because I think there's some significance to it. Um, these are the kinds of things, this is one of the reasons why I ran for Congress is I'm tired of administrative agencies using guidance documents or regulations or whatever it may be, fact sheets, uh, answers to frequently asked questions. I'm awful tired of, of administrative agencies and unelected bureaucrats adopting these kinds of mandates that can cost our industry billions of dollars and Congress never, sets, never lays eyes on what it is that they're doing. That is, that is truly what is, what, what, what is destroying our republic, is that our congressional representatives no longer legislate. The legislation is being, the legislating is being done by the USDA, US Fish and Wildlife Service, US Forest Service, BLM, Department of Transportation. They're the ones that are doing the legislation, legislating, but they're not accountable to us. They're not the ones that have to go through what I just went through, which was an 11 month primary and going out there and selling myself to the great folks of Wyoming as to why, I should, why, why they should vote for me and, and, and I should represent them. And so that is one of the reasons that, I, one of the issues that I think that we need to fix and we need to fix now. I've talked about it for 11 months. I've, I've had the opportunity to visit with quite a few members of Congress now. And at every single opportunity when I have met, whether it's with Jim Banks or Jim Jordan or Leader McCarthy or Rand Paul, this is the issue that I bring up. And one of the things that I talk to them most about is exactly what, our, what RCAF has done in pushing back against these RFID mandates. This is the example I use. Because in 2013, when they issued the regulation uh, allowing for all kinds of identification, such as brands and ear tags and back tags and tattoos and all of those, the, the USDA specifically stated that implementing this requirement, an RFID requirement, would cost our industry $2 billion. That was nine years ago. We know that the costs have dramatically increased since then, and yet again, here we have an agency that believes that it has the authority to post a two-page document on its website and take $2 billion at a minimum out of every single one of your pockets. That isn't the way that we should be legislating in this country. That's, that's absolutely contrary to the very foundation of our constitution and our separation of powers. So that is going to be one of my highest priorities and I'm going to continue to use you guys. I'm gonna to continue to use you as an example and to praise what you've done in terms of your willingness to, be, to, to fight back against this kind of federal overreach because our republic really isn't going to be able to tolerate this kind of nonsense for much longer. Your congressional representatives need to step up to the plate and actually represent you, and that's what I intend to do when I get back in Washington, D.C. One of the other things that has happened recently, as you may know, is that the United States Supreme Court ruled against the EPA on implementation of the Clean Power Plan. And I cannot, again, as an administrative attorney, as a regulatory attorney, as a constitutional attorney, I can, as a, as, as a property rights attorney, I cannot emphasize for you enough how incredibly important the decision was that the Supreme Court issued just in June saying that the EPA did not have the authority, the legal authority to implement the Clean Power Plan. That is something that is going to, uh, will affect all agencies because what they did is they went back and said, what does, what authority has Congress granted to the EPA? 
And under the Clean Air Act, they determined that Congress never gave them the, the, the authority to regulate uh, greenhouse gases. They don't have that authority. So we always need to go back to the implementing regulations. We always need to go back to the foundation and look at what authority has been granted to these agencies by Congress, our legislating body. For example, I often talk about the Department of Education. The Department of Education was not created by Congress. It was put in place by Jimmy Carter in 1980. It is not a congressionally created agency. And so we always need to go back to that, that the organic act for, this, for these various agencies and find out what the scope of their authority is. Right now, as you may know, the USDA has issued yet another guidance document, and this one has to do with our school lunch program throughout the country. And in a guidance document that they know was illegal under the RFID, in the RFID situation, so we know these guidance documents are illegal if they actually have the force and effect of law or if they attempt to implement them. They're illegal. Well, the USDA's latest R, uh, uh, mandate, their latest guidance document, is that our schools are required to implement rad radical gender ideology or they're going to withhold our lunch money. In other words, you either let boys and girls sports or you're, we're, we're not going to feed your kids. The USDA does not have the legal authority to do that. And that's the kind of stuff that, first of all, in court cases, we need to be pushing back against that. But it's also something that Congress needs to stop as well. The EPA case will help us to do that because what the EPA case says is that these agencies do not have unlimited power. Regardless of what they may think in terms of if they have a Clean Air Act that they could regulate something that affects the quality of our air, their, their uh, authority is actually limited. That is very important, but it also does, it did something else, and that is it threw this ball right back in the lap of Congress. Congress has now got to step up and look at these issues, and again, that's where it belongs. We need to be debating it uh, pursuant to what the Constitution intended. It's uh, our, our congressional representatives, again, need to be representing us and making the difficult decisions. So those are some of the cases that I've been watching. There are a few things that I intend to do that are priorities for me. One of them is, is that um, I want the federal government to be required to use, in terms of our Department of Defense, as well as the, all, all the other agencies, I want our federal agencies to be required to use domestically produced energy. And I'd like to introduce a statute to that effect. One other thing that we need to do is we need to block the 30 by 30 plan. And I believe that there will be others today talking about it. We need to stop that in its tracks. It is an illegal, unconstitutional land grab. Joe Biden has absolutely no authority whatsoever to uh, try to take more private land out of production and use in this country. The federal government already has 612 million acres, and frankly, that's too many. So we need to legislatively block the 30 by 30. One of the other things we need to do is a no net gain for federal land ownership. In Wyoming, we just lost a 35,000 acre ranch that the BLM purchased. Uh, that ranch is now going to go off the tax rolls. Uh, it is uh, several miles of, of uh, uh, frontage right on the North Platte River. Uh, there is no reason whatsoever in a state where 48% of our surface estate and 65% of our mineral estate is owned by the federal government that the federal government should get one more acre in my state. We need to have a no net gain uh, position and Congress needs to make it make clear that Congress should not be out there, or excuse me, that uh, these agencies should not be out there purchasing private land. That needs to stop. And then the last thing that is, is a priority for me, again, relates to the work that I've done for you. And in October of 2019, President Trump issued two executive orders that are two of the most executive, important executive orders issued, and it has to do with regulatory reform and transparency. And what his executive orders required is that these agencies who issue these guidance documents, such as the RFID one or the one related to the school lunch program, they have to disclose all of this what I would refer to as informal rulemaking. It must be disclosed on their websites and it has to be clearly stated that none of these types of actions, these agency actions, have the force and effect of law. I would like to uh, actually put those executive orders and make them statutes. 
I would like to solidify those. Those were the when when Biden went into office in January of 2021. Those were two of the very first executive orders that he withdrew that President Trump had issued. So the agencies understand the power of them and the significance of them. We need to make them law. They shouldn't be executive orders. Congress needs to step up and actually codify those provisions so that these agencies are not able to informally uh, regulate us as they have been. So those are just some of the things that I think are very important from the work that I have been doing, the work that NCLA does, the work that all of you have been doing. I think that we really do need to get our elected officials to step back up to the plate, represent you, and do the legislating and take the power away from the agencies. And then finally, the other thing, obviously, is we need to return the power to the states where it belongs. Under the 10th Amendment, our federal government was never intended to, be, to, ha to have the power and the scope that it does. Uh, we all feel it every day. And with the bill that was just passed and that, uh, that Biden signed, I think it was yesterday or the day before, the $750 billion boondoggle, that is going to be a disaster for this country. We all know it. We all know it, that it's coming. Um, one of the things that I was visiting with an accountant recently, and she was talking about how it is becoming very difficult for our, our accounting firms to hire accountants coming out of school. I have a niece who has a, just received her master's degree a couple years ago in accounting, and I know that she was highly, highly sought after in the state of Wyoming, not to go to, to, go to work for a private accounting firm. But the woman I was visiting with said that their biggest competition is the federal government for IRS agents. And it's very hard to find good tax accountants, good accountants who, can, who are coming out of college that will go to work for private firms because the federal government pays so much more money, uh, the benefits are so much better and those kinds of things. But she said something else that was very significant that has stuck with me since I visited with her. And she said the problem is that every time that the federal government increases the, the IRS and hires more and more tax accountants and more and more accountants, she said, we're getting to the point where the only people who know the tax code work for the federal government. We're getting to the point where we in these small communities cannot hire accountants because there aren't any accountants to have. And when you think about the mentality, especially of the current administration, and you think about the mentality of consistently increasing ta uh, tax receipts, the desperation for increasing tax receipts, uh, I, coming from Wyoming, you know, our small little communities, Torrington and Lusk and Newcastle and, and Basin and uh, Sheridan, they have a hard time getting lawyers and doctors and accountants, and our small businesses are suffering for that. I think part of the reason we have to push back against this and block this if we can is that, again, if, it's, if the only people who know the tax code and the only accountants available work for the federal government, you can imagine the risk associated with that in terms of our freedoms and protecting our businesses from government overreach. So that's another part of that bill that is so destructive, it is, it is, it is going to make it difficult to get more people uh, in private practice in the accounting field. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us, there's no question about that. Um, but having the support of organizations like you in terms of doing the right thing, I look forward to working with Bill. I look forward to working with all of you on issues that are important to your industry, to RCAF, and to making sure that we can protect our food supply and our small business owners and our small operators. So again, it's wonderful to be here today. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, it's great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. No, yes, yes. Okay, Harriet has graciously agreed to just a few minutes of Q&A, so anyone have a burning question for this tremendous lady? Harriet, I have a question about property rights. With Executive Order 14008, 30 by 30, which is now renamed America the Beautiful, um, Biden is, this administration seems to be pulling back on uh, the forcefulness of the 30 by 30, now calling it all voluntary, 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 because they've held, heard the pushback. 
how do we, how are producers going to um, adjust to these regulations that if they're involved in um, FSA programs, USDA programs, how are we going to handle uh, those pushbacks, get on board or get out type of things if this is all supposedly voluntary? Well, again, I think it comes down to our representatives. I think we've just got to, we've got to block this statutorily. Uh, I know that Lauren Boebert had a bill in that I believe that the that it was any state that has more than 50% federal ownership, they not eligible for any of the 30 by 30 type program, whether it would be funding or whatever it be, would be. So that would pretty much take out the entire Western United States and it would focus the 30 by 30 that on the Eastern states, which is really if they want to do this, if this is about conservation and preserving open space, it's the Eastern part of the United States that they should be looking at, not the Western. We have the open space. Again, Wyoming's 48% uh, surface estate is owned by the feds. We're always going to have open space. That's why one of the reasons that I talk about conservation easements, that's essentially a conservation easement over 50% of the, of the land in the state of Wyoming. Um, so it is, it, it is something that I think needs to be fixed by Congress. We need to be blocking these kinds of things. Executive orders were never intended to have this kind of magnitude. Literally, he's legislating from the White House. There's no question about that. And then they're using the power of the purse to force people into doing things that are not either in their best interest and perhaps more significantly future generations' best interests. We're constantly talking about how do we keep young people in agriculture? How do we get young people to go to into agriculture? How do we keep our farmers and ranchers on the land? Well, you keep the, you, you keep the federal government out of it. That's, that's the number one key right there. You keep the federal government out of it, whether it's relating, relating to how we produce and take care of our animals, how we manage our resources, having access to the water that we need. It all comes down to keeping the federal government out of it. Um, and so I, that's, again, where I am always coming back to because that's where my forte is. That's what I've been doing for 25 years is trying to block these agencies from doing things that, for me, are, are just completely counterproductive and counterintuitive. Um, one of the things that, that I have done, and I, I, I may have told you this story before, but in working in Sudan on a, on a case involving Sudan uh, many years ago, one of the things that is so obvious for what they did in Africa, and Africa's got some of the most incredible resources of any continent on planet Earth, and yet look at the famine that so many of those countries live through year after year after year after decade after decade after decade. And in Sudan, because of the civil war starting in the 80s and 90s, they urbanized all their people. And they took them off the land and they put them in refugee camps. And over 90% of the food that is consumed in Sudan is imported. So anytime their dictator needed to control the masses and needed to uh, make sure that there would be no uprising, he just starves his people. You can look at Somalia, you can look at the Congo, you can look at country after country after country after country. And what they've done is they control their people with food. They control their people by limiting the food supply. That's what 30 by 30 is about. That's what the Green New Deal is about. That's what all of this is about from the Netherlands, trying to reduce their ag production by 30%. It's about controlling people through controlling the food supply. You know, I've always said uh, national uh, energy security is national security. Food security is national security, but it's also freedom. And so it's a matter of getting people elected who understand those things. And we got to go back to Washington, D.C., and we're just going to have to work like uh, just tirelessly to address every one of these things. 30 by 30 is bad policy from top to bottom, and we need to stop it. Yes. First of all, congratulations on Thank beating you. the Bush Cheney machine. <laughs> and secondly, what was the purpose of the arming of the IRS agents? What is the purpose of this? Well, I, I haven't really talked to the people who made that decision, but uh, it, it, it is, it's, it's just yet another domestic agency that is taking on what I believe is authority that it doesn't have and shouldn't have. Uh, your tax collectors, I guess, who was it? Was it the sheriff of Nottingham that tended to have armed tax collectors, right? Um, you know, I, I think we know the answer to that. It is to strike fear in the, in the hearts of every person across this country that we have yet another agency that's going to be armed to the hilt. And again, we need to find some way to stop it. It was signed in place yesterday. 
uh, or signed uh, signed by uh, President uh, Biden yesterday. It is a horrifically destructive piece of legislation, and we're going to have to try to unravel it as quickly as we can. Harriet, Bill Cluck, and uh, congratulations again. Thank you. Uh, uh, the state of South Dakota, if I understand it correctly, from uh, some of my legislators in the state, 60% uh, of the budget from South Dakota came from federal dollars. And how are we going to get these states to stand up on their own feet and, and, and collect what we need in the state? These federal dollars are manipulating our states and our local economies. Well, again, it comes down to my basic philosophy that the Tenth Amendment actually means something. The Tenth Amendment, which is that the power resides with the states. What we've done is we've just we've created a behemoth of a of a government in Washington D.C. And like any government, it needs to be fed, and the, it, and it's money. And so we send a, a, we launder a lot of money through Washington D.C. Whereas if we kept if we were able to keep that money right here in our states. We could do so much more, more efficiently, more effectively, and actually have a better government while also protecting our, our natural rights, our God-given constitutional rights as set forth both in the Bill of Rights as well as, as uh, our state constitutions. It all comes down to whether we believe that we should have a government as big as this federal government or the power should reside with the states. What we have to do is we've got to, we've got to be starving these agencies. But the last time, Congress doesn't do a budgeting process. This was a continuing resolution that was just passed. $780 billion of our money going to dramatically expand the federal government. So when, when I know that we want to say, well, we want to keep the federal government out of our, the, the, out of our states, and we don't want the money because we don't want the strings attached, my response is, that's my money. I don't want the money going to the federal government in the first place. I'd rather keep it in South Dakota and address the priorities here. You know, every state is different. Wyoming, even though we're a neighboring state, we're different than South Dakota. We have different priorities and we have different challenges, as does New York and Louisiana and Georgia and Arizona, whatever state it is. That's why our forefathers never intended to have a government of this magnitude, because they recognized that the closer that the government is to the individual and to who they govern, the better and more effective they're going to be, the more accountable they are. And we've lost sight of that, and it just fundamentally has to change. Um, Frank Andrews from California. Um, one of the big problems as I can see it is the horrible amount of money that is being poured into congressional and senatorial and even presidential uh, uh, races by the corporations, the very ones that are listed on that Tracy Hunt had up here. And uh, the profits, the enormous profits that they're using, they can pour into legislative matters. How do you feel about uh, getting a law that repeals or prohibits these corporations from uh, doing the same thing that private citizens can do in pouring this money into uh, these uh, electoral races. Shouldn't we be doing something to stop that? Well, that was the Citizens United case from the United States Supreme Court a couple of years ago. And what a lot of people don't realize with the Citizen United case, and they held that, that corporations can, under certain circumstances, they can engage in the, in, the, in the political process, and it's a First Amendment issue. What a lot of people don't realize is it was only businesses that were the ones that were prohibited from doing it, while unions could. And so it was a completely uneven playing field was unions were able to participate in the electoral process, but corporations were not. I've seen Tracy's uh, slide before, and I understand what you're talking about, and I think that the bigger issue comes down to um, we have empowered these corporations in ways because of the money that is pouring in. No question about it. We have to be, but for me, I look at the, the Googles and the um, uh, Facebook, Zuckerberg, those are the folks that have really taken over in this country in terms of trying to restrict our freedom of speech and our ability to engage in the, in, in the public square. 
I think it's an extremely complicated and, and difficult issue because there is a First Amendment aspect to it. And for me, I'm pretty much an absolutist when it comes to the Constitution. So that one of the problems with, with excluding the corporations was it's, that's how the, the ascendancy of the, um, of the unions, that's how they become so powerful because they were allowed, but the business side of things were not. One of the things One of the things that they were allowed to do is um, on loans to these countries in uh, Africa, the money went into any entity that would um, produce exportable commodities, cotton, tobacco, uh, different things that, that didn't feed the people there. And that's what the, the, some of these big corporations were doing, that trade they want these countries down there dependent on imported grain and that sort of thing that feed the people. They weren't, uh, they didn't, weren't allowed to get financing to do and develop an agriculture there to feed their own people. They have a tremendous capability there, but they didn't have the money to, the average person to borrow the money to, to buy that. That's a very good point, and that again is why paying attention and being involved with and having the information that Tracy shares with us is understanding that the, the, the food sh supply and the food chain is absolutely critical, protecting that, protecting our, our producer's ability to produce, whether it is wheat or corn or rye or cattle or whatever it might be, protecting that and making sure that we remain food independent is so critical because we now understand and I think have a much better appreciation of how governments and dictators and tyrants use food to control the masses. Harriet, thank you so very, you. very, very much. Thank you. We know that you... We know that you're an exceptionally busy lady right now and just from my standpoint, I'm glad you're that busy. So congratulations. Thank you.